Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and uh, we will be doing uh, quite a bit of discussion this here evening on the movie Happy Birthday to Me. And I'm very excited for you to listen to this conversation. It was a real, real good time. Uh, Court, of course, joined us for a look at, uh, at all the wonders that this movie has to offer. And, you know, it... <laughs> It's really interesting that in picking some 80s horror, I didn't initially set out to pick nothing but slashers, but that's just the way it worked out. And I don't regret this because it really has been interesting to see this kind of cross section of this style of movie. And, uh, you know, I've said it before on the show, I'm not a, a... like instinctual fan of uh, slasher films. I don't dislike slashers, but I find that if they strictly stick to the formula, I lose interest pretty quickly because I know what's coming and, and the kills are fine, but you can watch that in a super cut and the movie itself kind of doesn't matter because the characters generally don't matter. And this has been a nice survey of that because uh, you know, last week we talked about an April Fool's Day with Gary, and that's a little bit more of a parody, you know, kind of a mid-80s parody of these kinds of movies. And then you have Happy Birthday to Me, which, as you'll hear in our discussion, isn't strictly a slasher, even though it it falls more into that category than any other, at least American genre of film. Uh, but there's a good argument to be made that it's more of a giallo than it is a, a slasher. And I think you'll hear us make that argument and, and kind of have some fun. And of course it's just court and I jibber John and we have a good time talking. So, uh, I think you are going to enjoy the conversation. It's a really, uh, fun and lively conversation about a uh, happy birthday to me. And, uh, yeah. So I'll tell you what, I'll shut up now. Here's court and I discussing that very movie and I'll catch you on the back end. All right, folks, without further ado, uh, we have joining us once again uh, for the second time in about a month, which is both a rare treat uh, for all of you listeners and uh, and a horrifying burden for me. No, no, no. Uh, it is the return of One Chord PsyOps. Uh, thank you for joining me so quickly yet again here on uh, The Dark Parade. Yeah, well, you keep offering any kind of open slot, and I'm going to try and fill it. That is my want. And I'll also leave your money on the dresser on my way out. Yeah, yeah. I, you make sure that uh, you keep me clapping. That's how you know that <laughs> you're not getting robbed. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a, a little tip. If you ever happen to be uh, with a prostitute in a hotel room and you need to leave the room, is you make them clap yeah, while you're I've taking a you- beat. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. Um, Yeah, well, it's, you know, bears repeating. So we are talking about uh, Happy Birthday to Me. And this is a Canadian horror movie uh, that is interestingly produced by the same people who produced uh, My Bloody Valentine, which we'll be talking about later this month. But My Bloody Valentine came out before this movie because they rushed that one out uh, to meet like a February release and this even though this was shot before came out after that so you know if if you need a little trivia right out of the gate I uh, I'll say this about happy birthday to me I remember seeing this a very long time ago and this whole season is just 80s slashers for the most part that I felt like I needed to reevaluate. And with the exception of probably Hell Knight, which is a movie that I'll talk about at a later date and, and to a ridiculous length, I'm sure. But Happy Birthday to me, I 
I remembered part of the ending of this, but when I went back and watched it again uh, for this show and then <laughs> watched it yet again for this show, I had forgotten how convoluted the ending of this movie is. Where it's like, what, no, wait, what, what is happening again? I, I just want to point out that I don't really feel that Happy Birthday to me was intended to be a slasher. Um, I don't I don't know what they were intending to make, but what they ended up with is a gaslighting giallo that even gaslights you as the audience to the point that you forget that this is how the ending works. Like they just trick you into believing that it was the ending that you always thought it was. And when we get there, we'll we'll get there. But like, I'm the same. Like, I'm always convinced that I know 100 percent who the killer is. And then they do this thing and I'm like, oh. And then you go back and try to watch it a second time after that, if you're brave enough and try to see if it can actually fit into the timeline okay. But you have to try and figure out whether or not what you're seeing is who you're seeing. Um, yeah. It's really interesting and it pretty much lines up enough to where it could pull it off, but it's obviously not something you're gonna catch. And they do try to push that, um, ooh, watch a twist thing a little too hard. I, I will agree with that, but I like the film because it's doing a bunch of shit that I had never seen before, before watching it as a kid, you know? Yeah, d did you see it for the first time when you were young, as did I? I? Yeah, Happy Birthday to Me would have been in the H section of the horror place that I was renting A to Z, so I probably would have been like maybe 11 at the oldest by the time I got to the H section mm -hmm. when, I, when I started doing that, because I was renting every movie like in the horror section from A to Z is what I just did. Like I'm obviously obsessive compulsive as a kid and just as bad as an adult. But um, so like, that's kind of what I did. And then I would go to another video store and I would rent, you know, A to Z. So I would get the happy birthday to me probably by the time I was 11. Cause I was in like JKL stuff by the time I was 12. Nice. Nice. Uh, I, I respect the fact that you can, you know, kind of slot when you saw it based on the, the alphabet. That's uh, impressive. Well, uh, okay, um, I actually really identify with a lot of these characters, even though they're, like, horrid asshole people, uh -huh. because they're sort of supposed to be, like, cream of the crop, um, like, uh, education-wise, like, they're, like, the best in their class, they're the top ten, they have the brightest futures ahead of them, and all of that kind of stuff. The only thing I can't identify with is, like, I'm, I was born super fucking poor. So like that part of it where they're like also rich on top of that. Yeah. I I can't I can't really quite get but like the poor kids version of this where when I was in public school I actually was uh tested into uh they called it the gifted program in Pennsylvania but it basically was like they did an IQ test and then they did um like an accelerate like I was found to have an accelerated ability to learn mm -hmm. and um also to have um near perfect recall and retention and i've been drugging myself ever since finding that out trying to make that less than perfect for some things but it doesn't quite work <laughs> so if if i work hard enough i can actually recall shit like that like what age i would have been at the at at, at that that letter and things and it happens all the time where i'll tell my wife like oh you remember when we moved this over here you know, we had the furniture arranged in this way and i'm like describing it you know and i'm like it's right after we moved into the house after we bought it from when we we're renting that apartment that was over on the other street. And I describe all of this stuff in like vivid detail about how it looked. And she's like, what? How was that our life? How do you even know that yeah. is something that we did? I'm like, I, don't, I can see it right now. Just like picture it, you know? So I kind of, when, when they were doing the academic stuff and like how these kids are pranksters and just real pricks to everybody. And like th they have a sense of entitlement because they're fucking rich, but like that witty, always looking for like, pulling one up and like getting one over on someone is something that kids with that accelerated ability to learn. Cause there was a whole group of us in my school, um, that, that, you know, we just got pulled out and put into these classes, um, just basically to up the, the grade for, uh, that school. That's what it was. The program was there for was to help their, their standardized testing look even better. Nice. <laughs> um, that's what the program got sent to do. But, uh, uh, the other kids that were like that, we did shit like this to each other and like to other kids where we would pull pranks and stuff like because we were smart enough to figure out how to pull shit over on somebody. And, and like I couldn't maybe at that age beat you up as a little kid, but I sure as hell could set you up to like have a teacher watch you do it and then get in trouble for you 
doing it if you hurt me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so growing up and watching this movie at that age of 11 is about the age when I really kind of realized that I was somewhat different and how outside that that made me. And that's why this film resonated with me, I think, as much as it did. And I know this isn't Heart of Horror, but I wanted to give you a little life story as to why I connected with this film. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we allow it here. I'll cut it all out later. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Justifiably, it's boring as shit. No, uh, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. So I, I don't have a lengthy story about this other than ju just to say I had, you know, the typical crush on the lead actress of the film, Melissa Sue Anderson, because of my uh, adoration of her as Mary Ingalls on Little House on the Prairie. AKA the blind one. <laughs> it's because of those like stark blue eyes of hers that they made her blind, isn't it? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And and also like she had that deal where she would just kind of like stare past the actor talking uh, to her. And I don't know how accurate it, uh, her representation of a blind girl was. All I know is that uh, you know by the time. Uh, Little House on the Prairie was wrapping up. You know, she was married and all kinds of things. They didn't, you know, just stake her out in the woods and let the coyotes get her. It wasn't that kind of show. It wasn't 1883, for Christ's sakes. You, you say that, but then there was that whole episode where Ma Ingalls was left alone while the rest of the family went to town, and she hurt her leg, and it started to get infected. And there was a point where she thought she was going to have to cut her own leg off. But then the family showed up just in time before she started sawing. So that's, that's pretty grim, right? It sure was, and it left a mark. Um, but anyway, so Melissa Sue Anderson was uh, was cast in the movie. It was you know this is eighty one. This is hot on the heels of Friday the Thirteenth, and and sort of that era of oh what if we made a slasher built around X holiday, whether it's Friday the 13th or, uh, you know, Valentine's day with my bloody Valentine or April fool's day or, uh, you know, St. Swithin's day or Arbor day or whatever it was. If you can have <laughs> a slasher built around a holiday, then you did. My and bloody Valentine is probably the most Canadian of all of the Canadian slashers. Because um, I don't I consider this so one much. a slasher, really. Yeah, th you're right. I think this is more of a weird kind of giallo. But I don't think it means to be. I think it means to be a slasher. It just isn't very good at being a slasher. And so it falls ass backwards into being a giallo film. Yeah, it makes a beautiful landing at the completely wrong airport. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I've heard your word. We're going to have to bring you down. Happy birthday to me. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring you down a little bit short of uh, Slasherville. You're gonna be landing in uh, Giallo Court. Um, uh, this is Giallo Court. Uh, you are cleared for a landing. Uh, we weren't supposed air. to land here, eh? Uh, Canadian Slasher Air. You need to reroute to Giallo Ground. This is Giallo Ground yeah. Tower <laughs> to Slasher Canadian One. <laughs> this is Giallo Actual. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's let's get into the story of this, and then we'll we'll talk about uh, why it doesn't really work as a slasher on the back end. But uh, so, as you alluded to, this is all about uh, a bunch of rich kids known as the top ten at the esteemed Crawford Academy, and. Uh, somewhere in Massachusetts, I think they, they they make up a place called Exeter, Massachusetts. And in our opening scene, we've got this girl, Bernadette, who is leaving class late at night. Um, we get kind of a fake scare where she's tripped up by uh, a leash, as it turns out. And this pretty terrible looking bulldog is barking at her. And we're, yeah, it's the bulldog's leash that somehow get whipped around her to the sound of a whip cracking. You would think that Indiana Jones was about to swing from these legs. And right, like I thought the killer whipped her legs the first time I watched this. Yeah. and was about to drag her, you know, but no, that's not what happened. It's a false scare. And she comes face to face with 
Mrs. Patterson, who is, I think, the headmistress of Crawford Academy is her position here. Yeah, and is Crawford Academy like a finishing school where it's like high school and then like a couple of years, like sort of to get you ready for a major college, like for doctorates or something? Because they're all able to drink and they're at pretty much a boarding school, right? Yeah, I. Uh, this could be a, a, hey, we're all seniors at this private academy and, and the drinking age is 18 and also the rules are a little lax for the best and brightest of the Crawford Academy. I'll accept that. Maybe. I, I'm really filling in some backstory here that doesn't exist, but I had the same question of like, wait, are, are they all of age? But I think this was at a time when the drinking age was probably 18. Well, I was thinking that too. And then also I kind of realized that in some places, some states would have a significantly lower drinking age, like a place that would be a college town I could see having a lowered drinking age specifically to attract a certain crowd and if these are truly a bunch of overachievers staying at this academy for that exact reason and not moving on to something more prestigious like harvard seems like the kind of thing that your classic underachieving fucking kid would do yeah yeah especially a place like Massachusetts. am i right <laughs> right and anyway so this girl bernadette after getting a dressing down from mrs patterson is like, okay, I'm going to go to the village inn, which is where all her friends are waiting. And she gets in her car and is attacked by somebody waiting for her in the back seat. This is the most brutal and realistic strangulation scene that I can think of on film that I've seen. Like, I watched it today and it made me just as uncomfortable and squirm just as much. All the kicking yeah. and fighting that she does. And then she still pretty much succumbs to him. It's just horrific. Well, I think the idea is that she plays possum a little bit here, which I like. Like, she struggles and there's like, ick. And the killer uh, seems to be like, oh, well, job well done. You know, pat on the back. And then she just bolts out of this car. Yeah, I think you're right. I do think she's playing possum. I just didn't want to steal your thunder by saying that. Oh, to be, well, you know, I, I do come from the South where possums l truly litter every side of the road. Uh, <laughs> you, I, I pass one. There has been, this is true, every day that I walk my dog, which is pretty much every day, there is a possum that was hit. And because I live kind of in a rural part of uh, Tennessee... Um, there and I live outside the city limits. There's not really somebody that comes and scrapes up these dead animals. And so, over the course of say eh, about a month, I have watched this possum go from like, oh, that poor animal got hit, to now it's just a complete possum skeleton by the side of the road. That and, must have taken a long time. Nah, not that long. I mean, between bugs and a little bit of heat, that. <laughs> Uh, and there's still a little bit of, bit of fur clinging here and there, but if you, if it, hey, if there is a lister that would like a complete and intact uh, possum skeleton, then, you know, hit me up on the socials. I can make your dreams come true. You can add it to part of your possum kingdom. Oh, uh, make up your mind. Anyway. <laughs> so, after she takes off out of the car, there she sees somebody comes face to face with somebody that we don't see but she's like oh my god thank god you're here please help me and then the unseen killer here pulls out a straight razor whips it across her throat and so long bernadette that slashed throat is on point i love how they cut just before the blood spray mm -hmm. that you would get in a true giallo i i ordinarily would be really like upset that I didn't get a bunch of crimson spray, but there's something about that throat slit after the strangulation and just the way the killer's just frustrated and just like improvises and does this <laughs> for the brutality of it and everything. I just, I'm in like right off the bat and I don't even care. I didn't get a big splash of blood. Yeah. There are some pulled punches in this movie that is not because director J. Lee Thompson wanted to pull those punches. It's just that the movie originally got an X rating and they kept having to kind of go back and like, all right, what if we cut this blood? All right, what if we don't show the tire really mingling this guy's face? 
and and so on and so forth until uh, they they got the the R rating that they wanted. But um, I would like to have that cut restored, man. I would love to fucking see that. You know what's crazy about this though is that this is the same director as like Cape Fear, and you know like uh, uh, the Great Tycoon and that weird. Uh, movie with Charles Bronson, The White Buffalo, and like he did some like crazy movie. And Cape Fear is, you know, a Stone Cold classic. And then he gets hooked up with Canon Films on the back end, it, like right after Happy Birthday to Me, and ends up doing, you know, like King Solomon's Mines and Firewalker and Death Wish Four and, you know. <laughs> that kind of stuff on the on the back end of his career but i mean by that point he was 70 years old when he was doing those movies but like he did the guns of navarone you know jesus yeah and conquest of planet of the apes which is a pretty rad movie and like anyway genuinely a good director uh but apparently wanted to make this a little more gruesome than it turned out to be at any rate we cut away from this murder to the village inn where there are a bunch of shriners singing a uh, hundred bottles of beer on the wall yeah, they're about 75 down i think by the time we get to them somewhere around there it's maddening there like there is about to be an altercation we're going to talk about and i'm fully on the side of the kids with for this one but uh so melissa sue anderson who plays virginia in the movie she shows up and uh we've got her we've got um steve as played but let me let me get my cast list here so you've got um ann played by tracy bergman you've got steve played by matt craven who went on to do a lot of stuff like you would recognize he he was the most recognizable face to me besides um the uh uh uh, Melissa Sue Anderson. And yeah, he has the most recognizable and punchable face in unison. Yeah, yeah. Most uh, people would recognize him from Flatliners, I think, um, is like the biggest movie I can think of that he was in. Yeah, he was in Crimson Tide. He's, I didn't see that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, you should see Crimson Tide. That's a pretty good movie. Uh, uncredited rewrite from Quentin Tarantino on Crimson Tide. Um, he was in a few good men. Okay, yeah, people would probably recognize him. At he was in Assault on Precinct Thirteen, the remake, not the good one. <laughs> Thank you for phrasing it that way. Sure. <laughs> what else was he? He was in Crash. Uh, wait, wait, the good one or the one about racial inequality and uh, <laughs> and racial justice? Neither. Um, a movie that is called Crash, but is also known as Breach of Trust with <laughs> Michael Bean. Okay, now I'm really lost and confused. Yeah, that's how I like to keep it on this show. Um, he was in Jacob's Ladder? Yeah, I think he was one of the army buddies, wasn't he? Yeah, I think that's right. And and probably oh. the, the best movie he was in was I don't know how big a part he had in it I can't remember but he was in uh, Chattahoochee with uh, Gary Oldman and Francis McDormand which is a pretty good movie what's really funny is you start mentioning these movies and I know that I've seen them and then I instantly see his face and I recognize his face in the film and I can recall him being in there you know interestingly he and we'll talk about Alfred in a minute but they were both in Meatballs <laughs> So the guy who played Alfred played Spaz in in Meatballs. It has been so fucking long since I've seen Meatballs. It's uh, I you know I have a lot of fondness for that movie, even though I don't think it holds up all that well. Um, oh, I'm sure it's not as good as I thought it was when I was younger. Uh, oh, sure. But all right, so you've got uh, a girl named Maggie who's played by Lenore Zan. You've got Rudy, who's the real Weisenheimer of the group, as played by David Eisner. You've got um, a motorcycle enthusiast named Etienne, who's played by uh, Michelle Rene Labelle. Uh, and then you've got a girl named Amelia, uh, played by Lisa Langlois. And uh, then Bernadette is Leslie Donaldson, but she's dead by the point that we're assembling all of these, uh, all of these characters. And 
anyway, so they're all cutting up at the village inn. There's a little bit of static when the Shriners lose count of where they were and the hundred bottles of beer on the wall and start over. Which is kind of the kid's fault. I'm not defending the Shriners. I'm just saying the kids did fuck up the count. You're not wrong, but also knock it off, Shriners. Well, okay, first of all, I am so on the team of kick the fuck out of all the Shriners at that bar. Uh -huh. Absolutely. That's why I don't go to bars, Bill. That's why I do not go to bars, man. <laughs> Did you call me Bill? I, no, I meant to say Bo. I am sorry. It's okay. It happens. Yeah. yeah no, I was I, just I, making I just... sure that we didn't have somebody else on this call. <laughs> Their call is coming from inside your house. No, uh, that's why. <laughs> that's why I don't I'm go to bars. I'm by now. bills. Yeah, I, I don't know why Shriner made me call you Bill. That's weird. Maybe it's something I need to bring up with a therapist, oh, right? Oh, blame it on the Shriners. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, all right, but yeah, so Rudy, our Weisenheimer, is like, all right, let, let me, let's clear the air here. We don't want any static between us and, and the Shriners. But he has taken a mouse that Alfred brought with him. Because Alfred's kind of the weirdo of the group. Also, he has a mouse up until this scene, and then it's never mentioned again. But everybody seems to know this mouse and really likes it. Okay, yes, it is a complete and total work for this gag they're about to do. But I'm going to give it to the film. I'm just going to let it go and not pay attention because the glorious murders that are about to happen. Yeah. So, so Rudy orders a beer for the head Shriner, who was getting all up in arms. And while he's not looking, Rudy slips the mouse into the beer stein. The Shriner goes to get a drink and, oh, there's a mouse in it. And then, wah, wah, wah. right, it's all the Shriners are like, we're going to kick your ass. And they have to, all the kids run out and they get to their cars and or motorcycles, as is the case with Etienne. And they decide they're going to take off. There's a drawbridge in town, which wasn't really in town. They had to shoot that elsewhere. But there's a drawbridge. Are you working the things you may not know about this movie into the review? <laughs> no, no, no. I've got a list of those. This isn't one of them. This just happens to be a thing that I happen to know about the movie where they there was a this was mostly shot in Canada, but there was no drawbridge where they shot it. And so they had to shoot all the drawbridge stuff in New York because that was the closest place that had a drawbridge. <laughs> That's a hell of a commute. Yeah. So they the the strawbridge is, is raising and Steve, aka Matt Craven from A Few Good Men and Meatballs, it <laughs> says, Hey, we need to play this game that we all enjoy so much, which is the game is just to drive very fast and jump over the gap in the drawbridge. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a very clever game for a bunch of kids who are supposed to be top of their class. Right. And so Virginia, or Jenny, the Melissa Sue Anderson character, is in a car with um, Greg and Amelia. And when they go over, she loses her shit and screams, Mother, much like Norman Bates. Yeah, I saw that too. And... Uh, on the other side of it, she is trying to get out of the car before it even stops moving. And they, they talk her out of that. But she does, as soon as the car comes to a stop, she bolts. She gets out of the car and takes off. And all the other kids are like, what got into her? And uh, Etienne is like, oh, 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 I'll go find out. And so Jenny goes to a cemetery where she visits her mother mother's grave and it's telling her like, oh, you're, you'd be so proud of me. I'm one of the top 10 now. I'm really well liked, all this stuff. And Etienne kind of sneaks up on her and is trying to put the moves on her. And it's like, hey, how about I walk you home? And Jenny is like, I know what you're like. You can, you can kind of keep it to yourself. But then, so she goes home, but Etienne follows her anyway. And goes to watch her basically undress by climbing up the trellis and that kind of thing to her upstairs uh, bedroom. And we do get a little bit of disco music as Melissa Sue Anderson 
you know, gets down to the bra and panties to, I guess, this is what some people were coming for. So, whatever. Uh, titillation. Yeah, yeah. There's really, uh, there's not a whole lot of nudity in this movie, which is kind of unusual. Um, even, you know, we talked about April Fool's Day in the previous episode, which there isn't a lot of nudity, but th there's certainly a lot of sexuality and there's really not that much in this movie. It's much more chaste in a lot of ways. The interesting thing about this film is if you took out all the grotesque murders, you could have all these kids disappear. And then the mystery would just be that it was a prank on the girl and it would be like an after school special for the kids. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Or like a, a murder she wrote episode. I was actually thinking that as well. Yeah, I've been rewatching Murder She Wrote to fall asleep to. <laughs> Jessica Fletcher, one of the great uh, detectives of our time. <laughs> it's really convenient that it's basically a bike ride away for every murder she has to solve, though. Too. Well, yeah, you know. Ju well, uh, the same thing goes for uh, something like Monk. You know, it's just everywhere <laughs> he goes, somebody is dying. <laughs> right, it just so happens that he's there at the right time to make sure that they don't go unpunished, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so she ends up seeing ATN peeking through the window and, and screams when uh, some glass falls and he runs off into the night and so forth. And then we go to the next day, which is their chemistry class. And we've got uh, a real you know buddy teacher teaching them all about static electricity and some uh i think it's rudy who's cranking up the static electricity machine or whatever and making this doctor's hair stand on end and he has a real gotcha moment where he's like you know the one thing that i haven't taught you idiots yet about static electricity is that it needs to be discharged and then he shocked it shocks this kid with a animated lightning bolt uh, of cartoonish proportions that brings us back to after school special level of making of film it's like watching shazam on the electric company or something it is <laughs> absolutely wonderful <laughs> yeah there's there's certain things that you have to give this film some leeway on and that animation of the lightning bolt is one of them they could have just done a straight line they chose that for aesthetic purposes yeah. for some reason and that's fine by me yeah i mean you would normally only see this kind of lightning when somebody's about to become a superhero <laughs> right yeah but so then this doctor starts to show off like oh you can actually i've got this dead frog on a tray and if i apply some electricity it can make the the frog legs kick and then we get our first flashback to jenny's recent past which is her laying in an operating room where some doctors are operating uh not well not operating yet but she's in a big machine with her head all bandaged up and starting to twitch on a table and a bunch of doctors are like yes everything is going swimmingly and you're like oh she's got traumatic head injury like a serial killer yeah, it's interesting that they included that because that wasn't really that wasn't really something that was like super broadcast back then, right? Like I don't you wouldn't think have seen so. that on like you wouldn't have seen that on like CSI because that kind of like murder investigation shows were still following the cops on the beat, you know, and that kind of thing. They weren't getting into like the forensics and the evidence and shit like that or the the psychology as much. You would have a psychiatrist come in and they would get a confession out of somebody in like a TV show of this era but you wouldn't have like that level of understanding you know yeah i think this is much more the idea of like oh she got her brain busted and so maybe she's not right <laughs> like i don't think it's quite as sophisticated as like oh, oh i think they get even more exploitative than that i think they're just like she was experimented on and could possibly be a frankenstein now <laughs> yes you're right because there is a lot of like oh we're kind of poking around in her head crossing our fingers and hoping this works they're basically poking her brain with a stick at one point going, come on, do something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And right, it is very much the idea of, oh, we can make her brain grow back, uh, as we'll find out. <laughs> I'm here all day for this, man. Like, the weirder this got, the more I loved it then and the more I love it now. It's not far from uh, science crazed, quite frankly. 
another <laughs> Canadian horror epic. But <laughs> we, but a, after this flashback, she goes to see her doctor, a guy named David, as played by Glenn Ford, aka Superman's dad in the good Superman movie. <laughs> I accept that. <laughs> and, that's my paw can't yes yeah absolutely you know oh no oh no he says as he grabs his arm and collapses dead um uh, <laughs> it's so good all these my paw can't all these powers and i couldn't even save him <laughs> now i just want to watch that richard daughter superman again that movie is awesome uh so With the dick Connor cut of it i either one both good both good i argue the dick donner cut is yeah it's fine but the original cut totally fine too oh yeah i'm just my preference sure sure yeah i'm throwing no shade either way um so anyway yeah, watch what you love <laughs> by all means yeah watch them both watch them both back to back that uh, that's a, a good afternoon um so we cut over to a dirt bike race where quite frankly steve is way too into it he's definitely got some money on this and jenny and all her friends are cheering at deanne who ends up winning the race and when they go to congratulate him he whips out the pair of panties that he stole from jenny's room and is like oh i had this next to my heart that is why i won and we want to talk about burgeoning serial killers. Let's talk about his behavior and how everything that they have shown him doing on film right now is the slow escalation of the Golden State Killer as he got started. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Etienne was Eron's before he, it was cool. Um, yeah. It, it's really upsetting like he not only has he been stalking her home he's stealing her underwear but we don't have not only her underwear but the underwear he watched her take yeah. off freshly leaving on the floor to go take a bath he made sure that he got freshly worn underwear which is even fucking creepier but to this film's credit we don't have long to wait before he gets his comeuppance yeah, I don't support a lot of the murder that's in this film, although I understand, but his I do. Yeah, so there because there are a lot of red herrings kind of thrown around in this movie, you get a look at Albert looking all serious, like, oh, I don't like the way that he is coming on to the woman that maybe I have a crush on, Melissa Sue Anderson. I think they're playing it that he has interested in her because he wants to buy her a drink and he wants to basically like he's trying to make an approach but he's being very respectful and slow about it and clearly the man upset her and he definitely looks angry at what he did i think he kind of understood that exchange and what was going on and he justifiably is looking at that man with scorn for that right but then when lisa and jenny show up at his place he acts like a complete maniac which he never had before and rudy's got one of those moments too of like you are acting completely out of character uh but we'll get to that in here in a second anyway so yeah uh atn that night is cleaning his his motorbike and uh he, he still has a scarf on like a moron and the killer uh who we again do not see comes up behind him throws his scarf into the wheel which drags his face onto the tire and then <laughs> his face gets chewed up this was another thing that they had to cut uh to make it a non x-rated film does that footage exist anywhere that you can see it anywhere i don't know i mean i wouldn't think so that feels like it was just lost a time after it was you know cut out of the movie to get the mpaa rating that's the only excuse i will accept as to why i can't see it yeah I, right i just don't think that uh, anyone making this movie thought it was going to be seen outside of the year of our lord 1981 that's fair back then it was fair to feel that way it's we had that with some of the friday the 13th that came a couple years later yeah yeah so back to the village inn where everyone is waiting for Etienne and, and Alfred to show up. And uh, Jenny and Anne decide like, oh, well, let's go find out what Alfred's been up to. So they go to his place and climb through a window to get into his house. And this is where they find 
a severed head on the tray that looks like Bernadette. And so they're like, oh my God, he killed Bernadette. And then Alfred comes in. And this is where I think he acts way out of character, where it he is acting intentionally creepy. Where he's like, oh, you found my masterpiece. In and his defense, he did catch them breaking into his apartment. Right, but that doesn't excuse the behavior, the behavior of a psychopath that he is engaging in here. Like, that is more I of a... I admit to you that each of these kids actually is a mini fucking psychopath. Yeah. And it just so happens that the greatest psychopath of them all took the rest of them out and, like, assumed their power. <laughs> right, this was... A... <laughs> We, we were really just days away from a murder on the Orient Express situation. And <laughs> right. instead, right. like, one of them just snapped before the others got a chance to. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah, so he he acts all creepy, and they take off. And it turns out, like, he's, you know, not only is he a taxidermist, but he is um, also dabbling in makeup effects, apparently. And uh, we get a, a bit with Virginia and Anne who are asked by Mrs. Patterson where Bernadette and Etienne are. And they're like, we don't know. And she's like, I'm on to you kids. There was something going on with all of you top 10 morons hanging out at the village inn all the time. <laughs> if you worked a little harder, you'd be in Harvard by now. Yeah. And so they decide to fuck off and go watch High Noon <laughs> instead of you know, looking for their friends or taking any of this seriously. This is why I submit to you that they're all just basically psychopaths and it's just the one will rule them all. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to come around in this way of thinking, quite frankly. And it helps you enjoy the film so much more. It's basically Agatha Christie of psychopathic serial killers burgeoning. It's just one bloomed fastest. Oh, okay, well, all right. Speaking of psychopaths, let's get to the weird sexual politics of this movie where Rudy shows up and is giving this guy Steve some shit because he thinks he ought to be with Steve's girlfriend, Maggie, who Rudy had been dating, or at least seemed like they were. And Steve stepped in and was like, no, 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 I'm dating her now. And then their buddy Greg intervenes and is like, no, 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 you, you know, he's not worth it, Rudy. He's not worth it. And Rudy then gives Greg a bunch of shit about this. And we'll get like, this is establishing some character relationships that do not matter at all because five minutes after this scene, everybody is fucking everybody else. Yeah, it meanders a little too much into their romantic lives. And I think if you wanted to tighten this film up from almost two hours, what the fuck oh, were you thinking? That is to, a problem, yeah. Yeah, to if you wanted to tighten it up from like almost two hours, what the fuck were you thinking? And bring it down to like an hour 30 and a tight hour 30, you could lose these lost threads of relationships and just show a fight. The couple's broken up. They're teenagers. No one cares. Move on. Yeah. Uh, so we get to our next death, which is this dude, Greg, who's just a big muscle bound meathead who's lifting weights in his basement and the killer comes in and it's clear that these people know who the killer is. Like this isn't just some masked maniac again, making it more of a giallo film really than it is a traditional slasher, but he's like, Hey, thanks for coming down, babe. Uh, how about you throw on a few more, uh, a few more pounds here while I'm working out. And he asked for 10 pounds twice over. And then the last time he asked for another 10 and 20 is put on instead. Yeah. And so as he's struggling with these weights, the killer removes the rack so that, you know, Greg can't put the weights down. And then the killer <laughs> grabs uh, another weight and just drops it on his dick uh, which forces him to drop the weight suspended above his his face, and the barbell like crushes his throat, uh, which is a pretty good death. It may be my favorite of the whole movie. Is I find it extremely cathartic the way that that man dies. Yeah, I I don't really have anything against Greg because he's kind of a non character in this movie, but seeing uh, a, a weight dropped on a guy's crotch 
to then force him to drop weights on his head or neck uh, and kill him is pretty good as far I know as kills the, go. I know that the poster kill hasn't come up yet, but I feel like this would have been a like a, a better example of a possible poster kill where you could have the killer holding the weight above his crotch, you know, like an old school exploitation three on a meat hook <laughs> painted cover style. Yeah. And him holding onto the weights and like a lot of sweat and like his eyeballs are like bulging out and like their the killer's about to drop the weight, but the weights obscure the killer's face, you know? Like that would be a pretty kick ass poster, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people would rent that for like because they would want to see what the hell that is. Yeah, you know? and, and instead when it happens, it sells it really well. Yeah, and instead of the poster that's like, you know, you know, Etienne will never ride a motorbike again. You can get rid of all that stuff, and the the poster is is just as you described, and the tagline is, "This guy's gonna get a weight dropped on his dick." Opens Friday. <laughs> right, that's all you would have needed in 1981. Yeah. It's all you need now, quite frankly. Actually, yes, it would have sold me now. Yeah, I would have been like, oh my god, there, there's going to be severe genital trauma in this movie. Well, you we sold basically the basically just described the cover of a Tales from the Crypt fucking comic, and that's why those sold so well. Yeah, uh, yeah, this this is very pre-code kind of stuff. Um, But yeah, alright, so then we cut to a soccer game where Rudy scores the winning goal... Uh, everybody's very excited about this. And then Jenny goes with him to this bell tower. And there's a little bit of business about her being new to the school. And she's like, no, no, no. Actually, I was here four years ago, but I, there was an accident. I was only here for a few weeks. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm going to do some Quasimodo impressions and, and make some spooky talk. And then for no good reason just whip out a knife which okay it, they talk about how men don't listen to women and this scene is definitely a demonstration <laughs> of a man not listening to a woman at all yeah so he starts coming at her with this knife and then we cut away to the the floor of the church where where they're in the the they're in the bell tower and this is the floor and there's some blood that splatters on the floor and then a priest comes in to ring the bell and he yanks the rope, which comes flying down at him. And he finds that the the rope has been cut and there's blood at the end of it. And you're like, so what happened? For a second, I thought I was in a Hammer Dracula film. Oh, yeah, it is some good Technicolor blood. But yeah, so Jenny then is with her therapist, a.k.a. Pa Kent. <laughs> and she has this flashback to where they're ha doing their Frankenstein surgery on her, where they're just cutting open her head. And they're like, oh, my God, it's too big. So cram that back in there. Yeah, she has um, like a subdural hematoma, I think they said. And then he's like, she's dead. She's dead. Just put it back. Just close it. Close it up. She's yeah. dead. Like over and over again. And it's being repeated. And I'm wondering, like if this film was trying to channel all the colors of the dark and the vibe that that gives me and several other Sergio Martino giallos because like the motorbike thing was making me think of your vices a lot bro. yeah you know just like there's little moments of this that remind me of little bits of giallo that I've really loved and that's I think what made me make me really enjoy the film now as an adult more so than just the surreptitious oh my god this is so gruesome <laughs> stuff that uh, made me like it as a little kid Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yes. I I don't know that it is a direct reference to any of that stuff, but it certainly fits more neatly alongside those movies than it does, you know, a My Bloody Valentine or or a movie like that, even though it's same producers and so forth. But um, yep, like I said, it's a beautiful landing at the completely wrong airport because if they did <laughs> not intend any of this, they have done it so gloriously. Yeah, they... they accidentally recreated the giallo genre um <laughs> yes but so she goes to jenny goes to pa kent and is like i can't believe i don't remember what happened all, all i know is i was in the bell tower with rudy he had a knife i panicked and i don't remember anything else and she leaves but after that pa kent hears on the news like oh by the way we found a bloody knife at the bell tower of this church and we believe that there might have been foul play involved 
And so he's like, oh shit, I wonder if this girl has not actually murdered somebody. So he goes to find Jenny to basically say, like, you need to remember what happened because clearly something happened at that bell tower. But while he is out sniffing around in the garden, Rudy shows up in the school library to scare Jenny. And then they go out in time to find Pa Kent and Mrs. Patterson and a couple of cops digging up this skeleton in the garden of this school. But it turns out that it is like a, a you know, a laboratory skeleton because it has the property of Crawford Academy written on the skull. And so the idea is like, okay, well, Etienne and Bernadette are still missing, but everybody else seems cool. You know, that this is all just typical school tomfoolery. And then there's a weird, I think it's at an aquarium or a pool or something. I wasn't really entirely sure where we were for this scene where they all go to smoke a little, a little grass and Maggie plays dead in the pool, which freaks Jenny out. So she goes running back to her mother's grave. I think a lot of this stuff is very much just a work to have the set pieces and the sort of glamorous backgrounds, like what they're doing, which is so much more Gialli than Slasher. Yeah. Um, but what, so Alfred goes to find Jenny, who is at her mother's grave, and he comes close and is pulling something out of his pocket um which she i presumably thinks is a weapon or whatever and then jenny just stabs him in the gut with some garden shears that she keeps you know next to the grave for convenience sake yes that's what it looks like we're being shown mm, that does appear to be the case and so the very next morning, Jenny wakes up and her father is like, hey, I know your birthday is on Sunday uh, because of the title of this movie and all, but I got to go out of town for business, but I'll be back in time for your birthday. And so uh, he fucks off out of the movie for uh, the almost the rest of it. And Jenny goes to this school party, but because dad's left town, Jenny apparently has no more interest in Rudy after the stun in the bell tower and now as Steve who we last saw with Maggie um to come to her place now that he, she's like hey my dad's out of town and he's and he's like well let's go back to your place and have a good time and this is even though we don't get the precise shot that you see on the cover of of the DVD and the poster this is sort of that scene where they're making out by the fire and drinking some wine and cooking some shish kebabs. Well, they were already cooked. He's just serving up some shish kebabs as like a foreplay appetizer. Yeah. And then she just shoves the skewer into his mouth, thereby killing him. It would appear so, yes. That seems to be what we are being shown. This, this seems to be what has happened. And so her friend Anne shows up the next morning yelling at her, you know, through the, the window, through the upstairs window, and is like, hey, what happened with Steve last night? And Jenny's like, I have no idea. I really don't remember a thing. I remember we got back here and then nothing. And uh, so she throws Anne her key and says, look, I'm going to get a shower. I'll meet you downstairs in a minute. And so Melissa Sue Anderson, a.k.a. Jenny, decides she's going to take a shower, which leads to another flashback where we discover that the reason that she was having all these head surgeries is that the one rainy night, she and her mother were going over this drawbridge and it opens up and the car gets stuck kind of in the middle and they can't move until it opens enough that the car just drops into the drink and Jenny manages to get out of the car, but her mother drowns inside and on her way to like swim to the surface, Jenny hits her head against the bottom of a barge. And that is why she had this horrific 
head injury. But then she comes to and is no longer in the shower. Instead, she is outside the shower, but the water is still running and flooding the bathroom. And when she looks in the bathtub, surprise, surprise, Anne is in there and is now dead. This whole sequence is like an Argento facing your trauma to become a stronger person and then coming to to find that you have possibly killed yet another person or it appears and, that that's what we are being shown. Yeah, it doesn't have the color of a giallo, which is maybe if it did, I think I would be a lot more forgiving of this movie if it had that kind of bold color palette. Uh, but you're right. It is very all of this fits well into an Argento film. It's a very polite, very courteous slasher film as what it was intended to be because yeah. it's Canadian. It's very polite and courteous yeah. <laughs> of a slasher film. And so it makes it feel like a giallo, which is basically a more civilized slasher film. Right. This movie is saying at every turn, oh, sorry. Sorry that we uh, we showed you that uh, there. Uh, the, guy, the gruesome murder. <laughs> yeah, that, that fella getting his head chewed up. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry to any Canadian listener right now. I uh, am not. Um, so, <laughs> wow, your show, dude. Yeah, uh, look the the guy who directed Lost After Dark is Canadian. I do an impression of him that is best described as inaccurate, and I stand by my bad Canadian impressions. Um. <laughs> anyway, so Jenny ends up calling uh, Pa Kent. And it's like, oh, Paul Kent, I think I have fucked up. <laughs> and uh, he forces her to come to the bathroom to look in the water. And surprise, surprise, Anne's body is not there. So he tells Jenny, like, hey, I'm going to stay the night. And we'll, we'll look for Anne tomorrow. But in the meantime, you need to try to remember what happened prior to the car accident because that might be a key to all of these like blackouts and so forth that you're having and so sure enough we get a flashback that tells us the full story of what happened that night which turns out it was Jenny's birthday she had invited all of these kids over to the guest house of their mansion because again all of these Canadians are filthy rich <laughs> or at least these ta top 10 privileged kids of this academy are. Yeah. All, yeah. Melissa Sue Anderson and all her friends, richer than shit. And they're having the, the birthday party. She tells her mom, like, hey, these kids don't know who I am. Nobody's coming to my birthday. The mother gets super pissed about this. Dry, and, and by the way, is a bit drunk. And <laughs> so she... Lows. She's also drunk because she has a lot of clear baggage. Like, she's overly upset about this for a certain reason that we haven't been revealed yet. Right. She's pissed. Has one tie <laughs> on. pissed drunk. <laughs> yeah, she's double pissed. Go goes uh, across the drawbridge the first time successfully. Goes to <laughs> the house of uh, Anne's... Uh, you know her family because there's a party going on there that all the cool kids went to and she tries to get in but um basically is not allowed in by i i assume the servant of the house or something i don't think it's the father is groundskeeper it? the groundskeeper. groundskeeper yeah because he basically says that the family wouldn't accept her he might even just be security for this very reason because they knew it was going to happen yeah, and so the implication here, though, is, like, Anne's mother is saying things like, you know, my daughter has a right to be here. I can't be bought off again. And the groundskeeper is like, look, this is all ancient history. You need to take your daughter and go home. But even though it's never state, well, not stated here, but the implication is very clearly that Jenny's mother had an affair with Anne's father and that Jenny is the product of that affair. Also, I think the security guard was pretty much like, I don't give a fuck what your reasons for being are, for being here are. You're going to get tased if you don't back the fuck up. Yeah. Well, I mean, she is locked out 
of this gate and sent on her way. And so that's where, you know, they, uh, Jenny's mother drunkenly drove home and got stuck on the bridge and, you know, she died. Jenny gets hit in the head. And then apparently Jenny is so upset by this revelation that she runs out of the room, comes back in, grabs a fireplace poker, and then beats Paul Kent to death. Yes, Bo, it appears that that is what we are being shown. So then we get to kind of the grand finale, which is Jenny's father comes home, sees blood in her bedroom, runs out. Sprayed everywhere yeah. across the walls. It's a real horror show. Yeah, and apparently the guy who did the, the makeup effects for this was... Uh, spraying blood everywhere to the point that the director essentially had to tell him to chill because it was getting all over the cameras. It was getting all over the cast. Like he was having a grand time putting blood on all of the uh, set. That would be the first and last time court Psyops was allowed to do blood on a Canadian film set. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like, Oh, well we clearly we're going to need more blood and I'm just going to take this, you know, garden sprayer and I'm going to whip it around wild-like, and wherever it lands, it lands. You know, if you take an old fire extinguisher, fill it with fake blood after you clean it out, obviously, and then charge it again, you get quite a stunning effect. Right. <laughs> it's quite the party favor. And, all right, so we go to uh, the, the guest house on the way. Uh, her dad finds Pa Kent's corpse in the bushes. He... <laughs> oh no, it's like losing him all over again. Yeah. All these powers and I couldn't even save him. Um, <laughs> I know, all these reviews, Bo, and he just keeps dying on us. Uh, also, rumor had it that Glenn Ford doing a little bit of drinky poo on the set of this movie, which is maybe not surprising. The hell you say. Yeah. So, we get to the guest house where the father discovers all of the murdered kids arranged around this table and along with the corpse of Jenny's mother and then Jenny appears to walk into the room with a birthday cake singing the titular happy birthday to me and the father is like oh my god oh my god I should never have gone oh I have really fucked up as a father I've really done you a disservice and she's I, I always as a kid imagined when watching this scene I'm like I'm going to eventually have my parents be exposed to this tableau I know this is going to happen yeah this is just a matter of time 18th birthday 17th birthday it, it's somewhere in that neighborhood <laughs> this is a spread I will eventually set to disappoint one of my parents I know it I, I really like Melissa Sue Anderson's performance here when she's like so would you like a piece of cake daddy what do you think big piece or a little piece <laughs> and there's some, there's That's something in, line it, there it's something in the tone where it's just casual enough that it's like oh that's a nice juxtaposition of a very common question you would hear at a birthday party set against this horrific tableau the kind of polite um demeanor that she has in such obviously horrific circumstances is very unnerving and a great way to shortcut showing someone having pure full psychopathy yeah uh, it reminds me of some of the ways that the girl treats the boy right before she tortures him in the loved ones oh yeah sure yeah um <laughs> am i not pretty enough <laughs> <laughs> melissa sue anderson sings anyway so jenny ends up cutting the throat of the father another great throat slash with no blood because we used it all in the girl's bedroom and they're still cleaning it up <laughs> right and also we're still trying to get that r rating for this movie and jenny says like oh well everybody here is dead except for you and then lifts up the head of a girl that is sitting at the table and surprise surprise it's jenny shit now there's two of them right and she kind of comes to and it's like so what's going on here and uh jenny jenny prime 
the one who has murdered all these people, says, "There, all these people are here at your party, just like you always wanted, and uh, better yet, they get to watch you die." And so she's gonna cut Jenny Two's uh, throat, but there's a struggle, and then off rips a latex mask, revealing that this is in fact. Anne, who has dressed up to, and to quote her, she says, I, I learned to walk like you and to talk like you. And, and no one knew the wiser. And so the whole reveal is that she has been kind of slipping in chloroforming the real Jenny and drugging her in other ways too, apparently. Yeah murdering people and then setting dressed as her wearing the same outfits absolutely which requires a degree of planning that seems uh, let's just say difficult at best okay so annie's the real jenny in this or the real murderer in this or jenny prime and jenny in stein yeah. who has had her brain tampered with she even uses that and even uses that to her advantage the memory loss and then the burgeoning memories to just sort of continue the torment. And it's never been about the actual kills going on around her. It's always been about just making her suffer a little bit more every time. She's taking away everything that this that everybody that's ever really treated her well. It's such an excellent revenge story. And they sneak it in on you because you find out as soon as our unreliable narrator that we've been following the whole time finds out. Yeah. And the, the idea is that Anne was aware that Jenny is, in fact, her half-sister and has orchestrated all of this and is setting Jenny up to take the fall for all these killings. And they struggle some more. One thing leads to another. Jenny ends up stabbing Jenny Prime in the gut, a.k.a. Anne. So we're left with Jenny Stein. So Jenny, yeah, Jenny Stein is the only one left. As soon as Jenny Prime gets stabbed, in walks the police and is like, oh, why, you seem to have murdered this girl along with all of your friends. And so the implication here is that Jenny is now going to go to jail for a very long time. Or possibly a mental asylum. Or, yeah, or possibly an asylum. Uh, because she is going to be blamed for all of these murders. Cut to credits and the titular song, Happy Birthday to Me. And planned it the whole thing. Even the cop coming in in just the right time. Right. Probably called the police before she got stabbed. Yeah. Like, she set it up. She wanted to be stabbed. She wanted this to happen. This is how she completes her revenge. Yeah. Um. All right. So... That is the the doings of the plot. Let us begin our discussion of this movie with a quick look at the cast who we have uh, we have certainly mentioned. But I don't know. For me, I think Melissa Sue Anderson is great. Um, Glenn Ford is kind of fine in this movie. All, all of the kids are mostly fine. I I think maybe Matt Craven is a little bit of a standout just because he is overly excited in every scene that he's in. But yeah, he's trying to be like comedic and I think he just goes a little over the top with it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and that's kind of, you know, where it lands with me. I think, uh, um, the, the girl who plays Anne is good. Uh, Tracy Bur uh, yeah, Bregman, sorry, Tracy Bregman. Um, and sh she went on to do a bunch of soap opera work. Oh, and other things too, like guest appearances on various channels, you know, various shows and shit like that. Yeah. But that's kind of it. Like, I don't know that there's a real standout in the cast. Like, in April Fool's Day, it was kind of interesting to talk about that one because, you know, you've got like Amy Steele and Deborah Foreman and Tom Wilson. And I mean, a lot of actors that were. Not that they were known for a lot of other stuff. Like, all of these actors pretty much went on to do other work. But it was just such a fun cast 
like Ken Olent and uh, Clayton Broner and, you know, th those kinds of, of actors. And I don't think that these actors have as much to do. And I, you know, that's a problem with the script, but I'm really the only people that get to show off anything is Melissa Sue Anderson because she's the star and, uh, you know, Tracy Bregman a little bit because she gets to do the villain turn at the end. And that's kind of it. Yeah, they were trying for a sort of Breakfast Club slackers malaise film with slasher elements mixed into it to make the kind of movie a little bit different is what it feels like. And those elements kind of landed at the Giallo airport where they totally didn't intend. Yeah. I mean, is there anybody that we're missing that you feel like did a particularly good or bad job? No. Um, I feel like if we go back and watch Glenn Ford's scenes, knowing that he very clearly has a drinking problem <laughs> by this point, for sure. Uh, his uh, demeanor and glassy eyed look at things is very obvious and yet he still holds it enough together to deliver dialogue that would probably get stuck in the mouth of many a lesser actor <laughs> yeah I, I he's he's fine in it but again even he is just kind of reciting a lot of exposition and you know uh, it's a lot of you know jenny you have to remember kind of stuff well, yeah, again, they were targeting for a slasher film, so they weren't going for really basic stuff. And I, I feel the fault lies more in the production. I mean, the script isn't bad and the acting isn't horrible. It's just that we hold too long and stick around too long for a lot of interactions that don't enrich the characters enough, but it gives the actors some things to do. Yeah. So we can kind of be in, endeared to the characters a little bit more. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a push-pull thing. Like, I feel the time or the running time of those moments as I'm watching the film, but mostly because there's part of me that's just like, make with the death, man, make with the death, move on, move on, move on. Like, I just want that. Yeah. And so I feel like maybe I'm just being impatient because the film holds a relatively decent pace with the kill still, even though it's an hour and 50 minutes and it really spreads them out and you get a lot of freaking kills. And the murder frenzy at the end is still pretty satisfying too. <laughs> murder frenzy, my new band. Um, <laughs> patent pending okay so let's let, let's talk about themes then and I think alright here here is my, the two themes that I uh, sussed out from this movie um, one that I think is more interesting but is also the least developed is this idea of how like the the class that you're in and i i mean more of a like socioeconomic and cultural class and the social circles that you run in that that can drive you to do some pretty crazy shit that this idea of uh of being left out and being disenfranchised by your your peers and being dishonored in front of them in some way and losing face yeah, and I feel like there is something to be said uh, along those lines in, you know, in in regard to, like, this is all set at this kind of private academy and, you know, they're, they're the top ten and all that kind of thing. But the movie just never really explores that idea more than to say, like, oh, well, you know, the fact that Melissa Sue Anderson is kind of a bastard child drives and to do something nutty but also and, and also the mother you know and and that kind of thing and um but it, it, i wish there i wish it felt like that was resolved to some degree and was and was a little more part of what the story was you know that uh jenny should have been more of an outsider even even though she was part of the group there should have been that asterisk beside her you know uh that she wasn't uh, you know she she hadn't been at school that long you know this this is a a relatively recent return and seeing some of the ways that you know those sort of social politics can kind of sideline her um or sideline Anne, you know um but none of that stuff ever really happens and i i think that's kind of a bummer um, yeah I think they probably intentionally avoided that because they wanted the twist ending work to not be as 
readily obvious to you, but the way that they pepper in the other parts of the story and then they bring it up and heavily imply that, you know, the father of our main character is in fact also the real father of Anne and that the mother of our main character may very well have possibly been a maid that he took advantage of or an affair that he had on the side that she grew up in the town, you know, or something along those lines. And she was paid off, as she had said, to basically hide the child. But then she meets the husband that she has now and uses him as this elaborate vengeance plot to get back at the father. Like, there's so much heavy drama shit that they layer in and talk about, but they never really go more deep than, like, that sort of scratch-the-surface soap opera plotline of revenge and look at your long-lost half-sister. Yeah, yeah. If there were just were a little bit more discussion, if, like, some of her repressed memories were more about being left out and being sort of cast aside, um, that would be something. Um, yeah, they, they really heavily rely on the one birthday party incident, um, very much how, like, a Giallo does, where there's this one serious traumatic event that forever marks you as a killer. It's just that they also threw in a little bit of a twist in that, where it just turns out it wasn't the girl with the head trauma that was the killer. She was just the target of the main killer and was to be tormented as much as possible because of ruining her father's marriage to her mother. Yeah. Yeah. Because you exist. That's the only reason is just because you exist. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. I've been there. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> that was a loaded statement. <laughs> so the other thing that I think is interesting, but also is not very well developed is the idea of, you know, this head injury creating a situation where Jenny can't really trust herself. And it's, again, it's one of those things that's kind of there. But I wish there there was a little bit more robust exploration of this idea of like, oh my, you know, because of this head injury, I can't trust myself. I can't trust trust what's real and what's not real. And that kind of thing I think is fascinating. The movie just doesn't do much with it. This would really work as a more like a limited series, like let's say just like 12 episode run where they could really flesh out a lot of these ideas because they're trying to pack almost a franchise worth of story of drama and history of these people into almost two hours, you know? And it doesn't quite work because there's so many loose threads that they have to kind of abandon. And there's so many like surface things that they have to just set up and then leave it at the surface and not dig any deeper. But it's all rich, intriguing stuff with this kind of very VC Andrews style drama layered into mm. this stuff. I mean, all it's missing is like a brother and sister banging in the attic, but you know what? They can throw that in on the limited series. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> six episodes might cover it. Just saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is not like, this is what slasher should be, right? Is <laughs> they should be doing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like that would be more interesting. I mean, it certainly got the flashbacks. So. <laughs> right. That's what I was very conscious of slasher while watching it this time because of duncan and Bo covering it <laughs> I, yeah you and me both man uh, th every time it was like oh we're getting a little more of the story be a flashback i was like i yeah. feel you know canadian fellow canadian aaron martin <laughs> right telling telling the story of trauma induced serial killing via flashback is a canadian tradition apparently I, apparently so yeah uh ugh anyway but, but this, i would submit to you that this does it gloriously so much better even though there are so many things that i would like to see explored but i agree six episodes would do it yeah and well the flashbacks matter here that's one thing that's kind of nice to see that, well, right. i wish he, he took a page out of that book um all right any other thematic stuff that we're missing you feel like i, I again this feels like to me uh, uh, a lot of missed opportunities to explore some interesting ideas that just are in there but don't really go anywhere. Well, and I also, considering its contemporary films that are going on around its time, this film is so different and swung for the fences so wildly. Like, it's like some of the lesser Carpenter stuff where even though there's so much stuff that I'm just seeing these missed opportunities, 
I'm still enjoying very much everything that I get from the film. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, all right, let's get, speaking of, let's get to some final thoughts on this thing. Um, uh, go ahead and, and, and you say your piece. And remember, we need to score this thing. Uh, one out of five stars, half stars are allowed, no quarter stars because we're not monsters, unlike Jenny Stein. <laughs> Jenny Stein, fire bad. <laughs> Head injury, bad. <laughs> uh, but so where do you ultimately land with this movie um this is basically a 3.5 for me as well uh as much as i do enjoy it the um critical eye that i've had to view it under instead of just the pure nostalgic love of the film and just enjoying it for what it is i accept the fact that it is basically just above an average film but not quite going into the really good category it's just it's it's just it's just good you know it's just right there at 3.5 3.5 i mean yeah i'm gonna come in a little lower at a three and <laughs> that's exactly where we were with welcome to raccoon city yeah uh boy uh may maybe it's just the movies we're picking court uh well i actually i feel like i can't i can't argue with your number i understand why you're coming lower for me with both of these i totally do you know i, I get why because I think maybe I'm just being a little too generous because I'm kinder to both of them. Well, all right. So here's my problem with this movie. A, it is 20 minutes too long. I don't disagree. Um, also, and we'll get to this in a minute with, with the trivia, but I think the ending is unnecessarily convoluted. And... Um, there are some decent performances. The kills are pretty fun. Um, but between the, the runtime and the fact that by the time you get to the ending, you're like, what? No. So what happened and why? What? Who is this again? What is? So Anne is just very upset. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, she lost her mother because of this. So it's pretty much the plot of Scream. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it kind of is. And I think that's kind of a bummer. I Like, this this ought to be a little bit... It ought to be cleaner, you know? That th this kind of info dump at the end of like, oh, and I was drugging you the whole time and you never had any idea. That all feels a little too convenient. Uh, I always get and angry about that during a mystery movie when a mystery movie does that and that doesn't give you the information that you can maybe try and figure out who the actual killer is you know as you follow the detective i hate it when they do that in books i hate it when they do that in detective movies so i can't argue with any of that really yeah so that yeah that's why i land on a three but um and, and all right so maybe it's also because i kind of know the following information which we, we are now uh, arrived at the three things that you may not know about uh happy birthday to me um right. one th this has nothing to do with, with any of the stuff i just said but it's kind of fun the brain surgery done in the movie actual neurosurgeon operating on a fake brain so Oof. yeah man that was really realistic and gross yeah so you know kind of real uh which i like uh, number two is that this is the last film to open with the Columbia Pictures logo where uh, you see the, the torch lady that zooms in until the torch takes up the whole screen and there's the blue sunburst and it says Columbia Pictures. Uh, they, they use it from 1976 until 1981 and this was the last movie they used that particular logo. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, right? Uh, so, you know, you learn a little something listening to this show. But then, <laughs> here here is where it gets nutty. And, and knowing this affects my appreciation of the movie itself. Which is... So, the, when they originally released the movie, or were in production with the movie, they were telling the press, like, Oh, you know, we're, we've got to keep the twist ending a secret. Meanwhile, they had no twist ending. The whole idea was that they didn't have an ending at all. 
that the ending that they originally had was that Jenny was in fact the killer, not Anne. And then they realized, you know, as they were shooting this movie, like, you think it's a little obvious that Jenny's the killer? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really obvious that she's the killer. So late in the shoot of the film, they came up with this story of Anne. Well, oh, wait, wait, let me take a step back. One of the endings that they, uh, uh, that they had scripted was that Jenny was possessed every now and again by the spirit of her dead mother. And that's why she was having blackouts and, and was killing people. And then in production, they were like, no, 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 that's not a great twist for this movie. So instead, we're going to have Anne be the killer. And so the the actress who played Anne, Tracy Bregman, did not know she was the killer until they were well into the shoot. And so there are scenes that she's in where you would expect her to behave perhaps a little bit differently if she were actually the murderer. But she just had no idea that that was the case. So I, she's really good at hiding it. I I mean, sure. But okay, that's my retconning that makes me still want to enjoy the film. Yeah, I, and it's not that I don't enjoy the movie because again, I still think if you've never seen Happy Birthday to Me and you like slashers and or giallo films, then there's something here. But the problem is that the movie just springs this ending on you and the reason was is because there was just no ending planned that was satisfying. So they just kind of cobbled it together. And that's why I find it to be eh, a little bit of a bummer. Um, but that said court, what has not been a bummer is this conversation. I've had a good time. Yeah. Wow. I've learned so much about this movie. I've got to share so much about myself and, uh, I really had a great time actually talking about the flick and all of this because I made sure that I rented this on the H shelf because of the kebab through the throat uh, poster, but still think it should be the weightlifter getting his nuts crushed. Yeah. Oh, man. You will believe a man can have his genitals smushed. <laughs> By a 20-pound weight. Yeah. So that he will drop a barbell on his throat. Yeah. Oh, if only they had advertised. And, and, or included that skewer shot in the actual movie. That would have been nice, too. That that's always been a, a real uh, a point of contention for me as well. That the thing that's on the poster ain't in the movie. Um, yeah, but I mean, considering all the other weird choices that they made, I'm sure the mismarketing was just another thing. But it's still a great fucking poster. But yeah, if this ever gets a second attempt, if someone ever makes another pass at Happy Birthday to me, give us that fucking scene with the actual fucking skewer going into the throat like that. Absolutely. I This thing is rife for a remake, speaking of. Like, this is one of those rare examples where the right director could do something really fun and interesting with this movie um, and, and improve on the original in a lot of ways. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, Court, I'll shut up. The, the important thing to, to get out into the world right now is where people can find more out of you. Oh, absolutely. The easiest place to find me is Legion Podcast, the main landing and launching page, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops dash podcast. I'm also on Facebook as Court Psyops, uh, at Court underscore psyops on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm cinema underscore psyops, and that's where the meme dumps are. Yeah, meme dumps. Um, all right. Well, uh, as always, thank you for doing this. We will have you back again very soon to talk about, I don't know, some other weird movies. Actually, uh, probably the next time you will appear is the Juniversal Celebration. Cool. Absolutely down for that. Any Universal Monster movies I can get on, I'm happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should do Universal Monsters if I'm calling it Juniversal. Ah, uh, oh, man. I feel set up. <laughs> and uh, savor that feeling all right i'll be back in a second to close out the show and there you have it that is uh happy birthday to me a really interesting uh giallo slash slasher you know like slash mark not slash slasher uh it's not a slasher about slashers but what if it was what a movie that would be i don't know what would you call it eh, i don't know we'll workshop that later I uh, I really appreciate Court 
coming on because, as I said, we always have a good time talking about these movies. And uh, I hope you learned something along the way. Uh, I appreciate all the the support and uh, and the sharing and the downloads and the reviews and all that stuff. Uh, if you would keep it up, keep reviewing the shows. If you want to help out the video version of this, you can go over to uh, youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts and uh, you you give the video a little bit of a thumbs up. Uh, we will be doing another Sinister Sunday in the not too distant future. Um, probably that is going to happen. Easter Sunday. So as you're listening to this, it is probably going to be this Sunday that the Sinister Sunday happens, uh, and then Morbid Monday to follow that. Uh, if you're listening to this show either on Patreon, uh, which by the way, you can listen to all of these episodes a couple of days early if you go to patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts, and you throw in a buck or two a month and you get this uh, a little bit early. Um, you are also going to get a What You Watching with Jamie and Bo this here week. So, uh, if you are, are listening to this on the day it normally drops on, on Wednesday, uh, that will be coming on Friday. And also, uh, unrelated to the Dark Parade, but you'll also be getting a Pick 6 Movies out of me um, over on LegionPodcasts.com as well uh, as we kick off a new season, uh, Chad and myself, talking about Cutthroat Island. So, uh, that is all the self-promotion that I can stand uh, at the moment, but I appreciate everyone listening to, uh, those shows and, you know, we put a lot of work into it and hopefully you're enjoying it. Uh, you can always let me know at, uh, Twitter. I am at dark parade pod. Uh, and you can also find me on Facebook, uh, under the groups. Uh, the group is the dark parade. So just do a search for the dark parade on Facebook and you'll find that group. Uh, and jump in. We, you know, share a lot of stuff around and have some movie discussions and whatnot. So feel free to uh, join that part of the conversation. And um, I'm, I need to. Here's what I need to do, folks, ladies and jelly spoons, is I need to uh, get a, a permanent link to the Discord server because I'm on Discord all the ding dong day, and it would be a lot of fun uh, to use that more. Uh, for horror stuff. Although they're, you know, uh, Travis and Jason and Lori and handful of people are there uh, on the regular. So I get to chat with them and that's always a good time. So yeah, uh, that, that's just me spitballing. Little, little uh, freestyle thinking as you do. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for all the, all the help that you have given to make this show a success, which I feel it has been. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming both the, uh, the end of this month, next week. We will be talking about My Bloody Valentine with uh, with Derek Bourgeois, and I think you're really going to have a good time with that one, uh, as I did. That was a, a terrific conversation as well. And uh, then we've got more slashers coming for the end of the month, and then next month it's going to be a uh, watery horror uh, movie. So I think you're you're going to enjoy that too. Uh, so stick with us. we got a lot coming. Thanks for everything, and as always... Thank you for joining the Dark Parade. I'll see you next time.